starting to record the session right now. I believe it is being recorded. So the record button just uh, disappeared. I assume it's being recorded. Um, uh, okay, so with that, let me introduce the, the first speaker, Ariane Sore, uh, who will talk about thermodynamic consistency of driven quantum optical master. And I will, um, I'll let you know after 10 minutes uh, uh, that you've come to the 10 minute mark. Okay, Please thank away. you. All right. Uh, so, should I share my screen? Y yes, please. Yeah, please, please and I'll do. start. Uh, all right. Let's do this. Okay. Here we go. So, can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for for the introduction. So, yes, there. Uh, so I will be talking to you about the consistency of uh, optical master equations, a project I recently did uh, at the University of Luxembourg with uh, Massimiliano Esposito. And it should be on the archive soon under the name uh, Thermodynamics of Atom Photons Interactions Near Residence, so a slightly different name. All right, so the main focus of the talk will be to discuss uh, the coherent energy exchanges between uh, photons and atoms near resonance, but before diving into the core of the topic, um, let me recap some of the basic interactions in electrodynamics. So if you consider the interaction between uh, photons depicted here by a dotted line and atoms uh, represented by a two level system with a ground state and an excited state, you have three basic uh, um, processes. First, the photon can be absorbed by the atom and then the atom goes from the ground state to the excited state or a photon uh, of wave number k can be emitted by an atom. And then you have scattering processes in which uh, an incident atom of wave number k is absorbed and re-emitted uh, with an, um, another wave number k prime. Now, the thermodynamics of these processes are well known at equilibrium. So light at equilibrium with matter is described by the black body radiation. Um, basically, in this setup where you would have uh, some matter, so an atom here, inside a cavity with uh, with a radiation at equilibrium, the exchanges between the atom, uh, the energy exchanges between the atom and the radiation would satisfy the first law, where the type of the energy exchange is just uh, heat. So this is well known and well described. Um, things become more complicated when we add uh, a driving uh, field, a laser, which drives the system out of equilibrium. In that case, on top of the spontaneous absorption and emission processes which happen between the atom and the and the uh, photons at thermal equilibrium, you have now stimulated absorption and emission from the laser source. So the question is, what is the thermodynamics in that setup far from equilibrium? Usually, uh, laser drives are described by an external time-dependent Hamiltonian. Uh, which I wrote here, this term VAL for atom laser interaction and is time dependent. And quantum thermodynamics predicts that the work performed by that laser on the atom um, is given by this expression. So the rate of the work is given, is related to the time derivative of the Hamiltonian. Now, the problem is that when we go near resonance, meaning when the frequency of the laser uh, becomes really close to that of the atom, and in the strong coupling limit, that first law can break down. And there are two reasons for this. First, when usually when doing the semi-classical descriptions of the laser, the number of photons in the drive are assumed to be constant, whereas they do th this number does change because of stimulated absorption and emission processes. Second, uh, the strong coupling between the laser and the atom can create coherences, which need to be accounted for to have a proper thermodynamics description. So the topic of the talk is to address that question. Um, before diving into the thermodynamics, I will give you a more thorough description of this, uh, of the physics of atoms coupled to coherent light. Um, so the first assumption we're going to make is called the long wavelength approximation, meaning that the wavelength of the at of the of the laser uh, photons is assumed to be much larger than the size of the atoms and molecules, or uh, in this case, just of the uh, larger than the size of the atom. Second, we will make the dipole, uh, we will use a dipole representation for the atom. 
And in this representation, the interaction between the field and the atom takes this simple form here. We will furthermore assume that all the radiation here is quantized, uh, meaning that the radiation field is uh, written uh, um, in this form, where the A and A daggers are creation and, and annihilation operators. Finally, we will only focus on the case where a single atom is interacting with the photons, meaning that uh, we can choose that atom to be at located at R equals zero and remove any space dependence in our interaction Hamiltonian. So the basic setup under study is this one uh, represented here. So we have on the one hand an atom which is in a cavity where we have some uh, thermal radiation and all of that is also driven out of equilibrium by a laser beam. However, I highlight at this point that maybe that picture can be a bit misleading because here the laser is described by uh, a, Hamilton, um, a Hamiltonian which is independent of time. So what I actually have in mind here is simply describe that omega L by a single photonic mode, which is in a coherent state. The total Hamiltonian of that system uh, has is written here, has three parts. HX uh, describes the atom plus laser uh, field. So HX itself is decomposed in HA, which is the Hamiltonian of the atom. HL, which is the Hamiltonian of the laser. So written here as a single mode of frequency omega L. And VAL is the interaction between the atom and the uh, laser. All of that is also coupled to a thermal bath, HB, uh, and coupled via uh, Hamiltonian uh, VXB. OK, the first assumption we will make is to assume that the laser is nearly resonant with the atom. This allows us to perform the rotating wave approximation and to simplify the interaction between the atom and the laser uh, and to keep only the uh, non, um, uh, the uh, to remove the off resonant terms. With this approximation, the Hamiltonian HX becomes black block diagonal in the basis EN GN plus one. So what uh, what does this notation mean? This is the joint basis for the product tensor uh, uh, space of the atom and laser. So ENG describe the excited and ground state of the atom. N is the Fock basis of the lasers. In that basis, and under the rotating wave approximation, the Hamiltonian for the atom and laser can be written in that form. I regrouped in the first matrix here the atom and uh, interaction terms for reasons that will become clear in a minute. And the second term is describing the lasers, the, the photons of the laser. Um, the second assumption is to say that the statistics of the of, of the drive of the mode L uh, satisfies this condition. This is the case, for instance, if the mode L is in a coherent state. Um, what this assumption implies is that we can replace in this interaction term here, that we can replace the square root of N by the square root of the average and replace that term g0 times square root of n by a, an average g. In that case, uh, each block of the, of the Hamiltonian hx can be diagonalized using the same unitary uh, operator. What does that mean? So it will be easier to understand uh, this procedure looking at uh, what happens in the, um, on the right here on the Aiken basis. So, um, when I diagonalize the Hamiltonian HX, I can rewrite it in the form here on the left. What, okay, now I will explain where does the two, these two terms come from. Here on the left-hand side of this diagram, you have represented the initial uh, joint basis for the atom and the photons. And so those states, GN plus one, EN, et cetera. And uh, represented in two types of dotted lines, you have the two processes at play. On the one hand, stimulation emission absorption by the laser, which connects uh, states with uh, uh, EG with a, a variation of one in the number of photons of the drive. And then the spontaneous emission to the cavity, which connects uh, uh, states where the atom is excited or uh, in the ground state, but with the same number of photons in the drive. After we diagonalize the Hamiltonian, um, since the diagonalization is happening in each separate subspaces here, the Eigen basis here is only constructed by a linear combination of the initial EN plus one, GN plus two, for instance. 
But interestingly, now the spontaneous emission uh, process couples uh, eigenstates from those different neighboring Hilbert spaces. And instead of having a single frequency omega q, you have now three different frequencies that you can observe in the emission spectrum called the fluorescence triplets. Um, now, back to the picture on the left. How do we get there? Once you have diagonalized your uh, Hamiltonian hx, you notice that you can do the, the following mapping from the initial uh, Hilbert space, HAHL, to one of uh, DADL, what, so what I call DA is for the dressed atom. It's the atom dressed with the photons from the drive. And DL would be the lasers, but dressed with the atom. In the sense, it's the laser slightly modified with the presence of the atom. Once you do this mapping, the initial Hamiltonian HX uh, is a sum of two terms, one describing the dressed atom, the other one the laser, but you see that the interaction term is now completely removed. Okay, so after this long introduction to the physics at play, I will, uh, with the time I have left, talk about the thermodynamics in this uh, setup. Um, so I will begin by deriving a fluctuation theorem for the... Sorry to interrupt. Yes. You, ha you have about five minutes and that should yes. include time for questions. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it will be, I will go as fast as possible, but I think the main point was to try to understand the physics at play, which I have done now. So um, uh, we want to study now the en uh, energy transfers between this coherent state and the dressed atom. To do this, we can do, we can use a double point measurement technique with counting fields. The details are recapped here, but what you just need to remember is that um, with this procedure, measuring the uh, fluctuations of some quantity A can be done by computing the moment generating function GL, which is the trace of obtained of, of this uh, density matrix row, which is the solution of a tilted dynamics where we dress the unitary evolution operator with the counting fields of the quantity we want to measure. For example, measuring the heat uh, amounts to putting a counting field on the Hamiltonian HB. Now, if we are if we want to measure the all the energy exchanges between the dressed atom, the dressed laser, and HB, since they all commute, we can measure them uh, simultaneously and define a joint uh, generating function. Um, when the laser is in a coherent state, so coherent state is defined by this. It depends on a parameter alpha which uh, is related to the average number of photons and its variance. Um, uh, if we have a coherent state where alpha is very large, then we have a state which satisfies the assumption two that were required for the, for, for the setup at, that we're interested in. And under these assumptions, you can notice that in fact, the um, entropy of the coherent state divided by the energy of the field is in fact negligible, which means that we can consider the coherent state to be a work source. And using that condition here, you can derive a fluctuation theorem in terms of symmetries of the generating function, uh, which is expressed here. So this is relating the reversed uh, generating function to the forward one. And uh, the condition is that the symmetry for the bath is that you should shift the counting field with the inverse temperatures. But if you have a work source, uh, the symmetry is that in fact, there is no, no shift uh, required. Um, uh, an interesting point is that if you also impose a strict energy conservation, which can be expressed in terms of symmetries of that uh, object as well, uh, combined with the initial, the previous fluctuation theorem, you can derive a Crookes relation for this specific coherent uh, drive. All right. Um, so you, so, you have about a, a minute left. Okay, so I will maybe just give you the conclusions. Um, what was useful with this framework is that then we can uh, describe which master equations are consistent or not. Um, and the conclusion is that uh, we re-examined the, there are two main uh, optical master equations that are used in the literature, the Floquet and the Block one. And what we find is that the Floquet master equation is in fact fully consistent, so it satisfies this fluctuation theorem, whereas the block breaks this fluctuation symmetry, but is um, consistent on average. So that would be the maybe the take-home message. Uh, coherent light acts as a work source. We can derive a fluctuation theorem for such sources. And the Floquet master equation satisfies the symmetry, but not the block one. So very quickly, the semi-classical limit. 
uh, semi-classical limits the semi uh, in which the laser drive is described by a time-dependent Hamiltonian do require to make the Born approximation between the atom and the laser. And that approximation is valid for the block equation, but not for the Floquet, where the Floquet master equations, in fact, correspond to strong couplings. So just jumping here to the conclusion is that uh, what is interesting is that uh, the block equation, although it is not consistent at the fluctuating level, uh, you can uh, it, it gives you the correct thermodynamics on average in both pictures, in the dressed atom picture or in the semi-classical limit where the field is treated by an external drive. And I will uh, leave the slide of conclusion for some questions. I apologize for the rush towards the end. Okay. Thank you very much. We have time maybe for one quick question. So I'll, I'll, uh, maybe I'll have one. So you you wrote down the, these two different versions of the fluctuation theorems in terms of a generating mm -hmm. function and then a Crookes-like one. Yeah. Um, can the work actually be, I didn't quite catch it, can the work actually be measured there in terms of some Yes. Two point scheme or other other otherwise. Exactly, that was the point that the um, um, that the work is in fact uh, obtained by measuring the the Hamiltonian of the lasers, and you could okay. either you could either measure it in the dressed atom picture, so measure this HDL term, or measure also in the in the original basis uh, and measure HL. And in, if you just may measure the HL Hamiltonian, you would recover. Um, the expression of the work that you would also get if you were computing the time derivative of the of the semi-classical Hamiltonian, but you get quite different expressions if you if you compute uh, HDL instead. But in both cases, it corresponds to yes, actual measurements of uh, of a Hamiltonian. Okay, thanks thanks for clarifying that, and th thank you for that uh, very interesting talk. And uh, we need to move on. We don't have time for more questions. We need to move on to the next speaker.